Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now, here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. Welcome. This is the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Your host, Joey, the Italian stallion Mure, joined, as always, by Russ, the idea guy, Morgan. Russ, people are tired of hearing about the train that is coming, the tax train. We've been talking about it way too much. Are, are you tired of hearing about this? If you are, forgive us, because I know this is the third episode on this. And had we been a little bit smarter, Stallion, we probably would have went straight to the horse's mouth from the beginning. But when we had the opportunity to interview David McKnight, the author of The Power of Zero, I thought, hey, I would want to hear what he had to say. Well, I mean, if you listen to one of the other episodes, you might have some of the questions that we had. Like, I mean, is this really just a fear game? Is this just, hey, somebody's trying to sell more life insurance. They're trying to get us to, to act into Roth IRAs or what have you. So we got that chance to ask him that, right? We did. And it was interesting because, yeah, there has actually been a lot of write-up about his book, The Power of Zero, the new uh, documentary, The Tax Train is Coming. And of course, there's haters. I mean, if you don't have any haters, you're nobody. I mean, <laughs> like when you start getting people coming, you're not after dynamic you, enough, right? Yeah, I mean, you know that you're 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 ruffling some feathers, so that's okay. And he had some really good responses to that. And I, I think that when you listen to this interview, you get to hear kind of his backstory as to where he came from, but also why is this so important? Why does he feel like this message needs to be shared with the nation? And by the I also think that it's important, you know, that when you take advice from somebody, you need to take advice from somebody who's at least taken their own advice. Yeah. Joey. Taking their own medicine. This guy did our podcast from his uh, home in Puerto Rico. Why is that important? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, so Puerto Rico has some sort of a special tax advantage, which I I don't even pretend to understand, where you only have to pay 4% tax on your income tax. Yeah. So... The guy is serious about saving taxes. He moved his family of how many kids? Seven Seven. kids? I think seven, yeah. Uh, I I don't think I would do that. What what about you, Russ? Well, it just tells you he believes what he's talking about because he would not pack up his whole family, (laughs) move to Puerto Rico if he wasn't serious about finding ways to save taxes. That's extreme, right? Going to Puerto Rico, he's living in a a tropical area, but Puerto Rico is not known for like it's – uh, amenities. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> outside of uh, the the coast. Well, here's here's the point I'll take away from that. He takes in information and he makes a decision based on it. That's really all this podcast is about: is providing information that you can take with you and say, okay, how does this affect me? If you don't have the information, you're not equipped. You can't do that. Right. That's our goal in this: is to give you the information. Now you can make a decision that is best for you and your family. That's all we're doing. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that that's the a, a good point you make there is we have bias, right? We believe this, and that's the reason we're going to share it. We've shared it for three times. If by the way, it helps us if you buy life insurance. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, we're I'm unashamed of that. We, like, we're I, huge huge believers in it, and it's major part of our practice for sure. I, I, absolutely, but. Also, listen to the experts that he quotes as to why he made the decision that he made, where this information came from. I think that's more important because, yes, if I only sell something and I only talk about that, then you can go, "Mm, is that real information or is that just a, a sales technique? But when you hear it from David Walker, the former Comptroller General of the United States, you hear it from Ed Slott, the guy who has a PBS channel, and he's considered the IRA guru, and he doesn't sell anything, that's when you start going, yeah, maybe this is a little more um, accurate than what the financial entertainers out there want you to believe. Maybe maybe I I need to pay attention. Absolutely. Which, by the way, I don't want to waste any more time on this. I want you to listen to David McKnight, The Power of Zero, Part (laughs) 3, and let us know what you think. 
If you've been listening to our podcast, you're like, man, I love what you guys are talking about. I want to build passive income through one of these five pillars that you're talking about, but how do I do it? Stallion, tell them. It is so easy. So easy that we created the longest URL possible, so you may want to write this down. Freecall.wealthwithoutwallstreet.com. Go to freecall.wealthwithoutwallstreet.com, and you can set up your call with one of us. We're excited to talk to you. Folks, we have David McKnight in the studio today. David, so glad to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Yes, we are, we are so stoked. We just got done showing your documentary on the tax train is coming and people are scared to death. They are jumping off the train tracks left and right, moving out of the way of this train right now. Well, that's, that's great news. Cer- certainly the intent of the movie is, uh, is the, pa- the powers here, the tax train is coming. The intent of the movie is to raise awareness and, you know, I, I do workshops all across the country and I routinely ask uh, rooms full of people, hey, how many of you guys think tax rates are going up? And nearly every hand in the room goes up. And I ask them why and they can typically tell me why. Uh, but then when I ask them, how many of you have the lion's share of your assets in highly taxable vehicles like 401ks and IRAs, nearly every hand in the room goes up. So what that tells me is that there is clearly a disconnect between what people are thinking and what they're doing. And so in my mind, I felt like if we could harness all of this expertise from academia, from government think tanks, from, from, from you know, politicians, and aggregate it all into one movie where we could have one consistent, powerful message that tax rates are going to go up, that more people would be motivated to do, um, the, you know, to implement the required strategies that's going to insulate them from the impact of, uh, of higher taxes. Well, I, I could tell you firsthand, like when we watched the movie, it was it was kind of a pile and own effect to some degree, David. I mean, it was like after like the third uh, kind of sequence of, OK, here's another reason why taxes are going to be you know double or triple in the future. It's like, oh, David, enough, enough. <laughs> do, do, you, do you feel like whenever you, you're talking with people, it's like I, I need to remove them. I'm all sharp objects for at least a two to three day period or. <laughs> yeah, you know, if you look at the movie as a pattern for how I structure my conversations, it's pretty. It's a pretty good pattern. Uh, we we disturb, we educate, we motivate. So the idea is that if we disturb you with all of this ap- apocalyptic talk of higher taxes, and, and then we don't give you any solutions for how to figure figure out your way out of it, then that's not very nice. And we would have to remove all the sharp objects. But all we're saying is, look, there's a tax freight train that's bearing down on your 401k or IRA. We know. Uh, roughly when it's going to get here. We know in what form it's going to arrive and we know exactly what you need to do to get your assets off the train tracks. And tax rates are going up January 1st, 2026. You know, guys, it used to be that I would tell people, hey, in some distant, unknowable future, tax rates are likely to go up. I couldn't tell you exactly when, but probably 10 years from now. Well, guess what? With the Trump tax cuts, we now, now know the year and the day when tax rates will go up. So we have eight years to get our assets shifted off the train tracks come January 1st of 20, 2019, we'll only have seven years. So yeah. it's a, it's a message that has a lot of urgency. So for, for our audience who hasn't listened um, to our previous podcast, which shame on them, shame on you. If you haven't listened, <laughs> uh, they, if you didn't come to the movie or you didn't pre-order the DVD, which you have all those options, you can go to tax train.wealthwithoutwallstreet.com and you can still pre-order the DVD that Dave is referring to that kind of goes through all these core details. Cause we're not going to allow him to share all of it on here because we want to get into more specifics instead of being a general in that area. But I am curious how, what, at what point in your financial career, cause you've been in the financial services industry for a little over 20 years. At what point in your financial services career did you identify this is an area you see this uh, freight train um, coming and, and what did that look like? How did that start building in your planning phase? Help us kind of see behind the scenes there. Uh, it was probably, gosh, I always thought tax rates were going up because, you know, the, the math that the government has been feeding us for 20 years has never really added up. Um, but it was when someone introduced me to David Walker, former comptroller general of the federal government, that it all really crystallized for me. Because here we have 
you know, the comptroller general of the, of the USA, he's the CPA of the, of the federal government. He's the head of the government accountability office. Um, he's on the board of social security. He knows more about these numbers than anyone else on the planet. And he writes this op-ed that says, Hey, tax rates have to double as a country, or we're going to go broke. And when someone like that, who's in the CPA hall of fame, who's very good at math, who's studied history, who understands how these things work. Um, when he makes a statement like that, you tend to sit up and listen. And then when you really dig into all of the math behind why he was making that statement, then it, it commands your attention. And so I really, you know, I've gotten to know David Walker over the years. He helped edit the first chapter of The Power of Zero. Um, we interviewed him for this movie. Um, he's a great guy. Uh, we actually interviewed him in his house in Connecticut as he was running for governor of Connecticut. And, um, you know, when people like this, we started to realize he's not the only one. Larry Kotlikoff, one of the foremost experts on the, what they call the fiscal gap um, at a Boston University, all of these folks are looking at the same data. They're starting to, you know, they're, they're, they're singing the same note. And you, you start to get enough experts that are agreeing on this type of thing. And the, and the ones that don't agree say, uh, you know, we've seen this, these types of, these levels of debt after World War II. Well, folks, they, they just don't get it. They don't get that we are at an unprecedented time in the history of our country. And every year that goes by where we fail to act decisively on either increasing taxes, reducing spending by half, or some combination of the two is going to um, forebode really, really bad things for our country. I started to figure this stuff out and I started to realize that not a ton of other people were talking about it. And that when we did talk about it, it made sense to a lot of people and that people tended to agree with us. Mm. Let, let me ask you this, David, because of course, Russ and I have watched the movie, we've read the book, we, we are on board 100%. We know that math doesn't lie, but there are some people out there, there's the haters, right? Sure. They're the, oh, well, David, you're just a fear monger, like you're just trying to build this up to be something that it's not. I mean, what, what do you say to somebody like that? Well, um, so Clark Howard, I'm sure you guys are familiar with Clark Howard. He's one of those... Uh, financial gurus, along with Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman. He actually recently wrote an article in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution about my book and about uh, life insurance retirement plans. And basically what he said was that he is an inherently an optimist, meaning he doesn't believe in fear-mongering about the future of tax rates. So he's an optimist. Well, guess what? I believe that being an optimist and a realist are not necessarily incompatible. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive. I think you can be an optimist and still believe that the data that all of these experts are showing us doesn't lie. And that in order for our country to not go the way of the Roman Empire, we've got to either dramatically cut, spend, uh, cut spending or dramatically raise taxes or some combination of the two. So, you know, I'm not a fear monger. I'm a realist. I, I believe in the math. I think the math vindicates everything that we preach. And if you listen to the experts in this movie, you'll see that I'm very much not alone in this regard. Well, and I think that that's the key. I mean, the person who's listening to you right now wants to be in a 0% retirement uh, tax, tax bracket in retirement. I mean, it, we know that taxes eat up so much of our daily income. And when we get into retirement, we know that we don't have the ability to go out and create more. It's what we're doing now. We may be able to buy more assets and produce more income. Our, the person listening to you is doing that, actively doing that. But we know while we're working is our opportunity. But when we stop, we've got to make sure we maximize every dollar that comes in. So I think the idea of being in a 0% tax rate, regardless if it goes to 70%, or not is a good strategy is a good approach. And I, you know, we've already seen, I mean, the, the trial balloons on the government IRA and even them coming and taxing 529 plans, we believe it may end up happening down the road for potentially even say a Roth, which I know is in your book. It, that all that stuff has already been brought to the surface by the politicians. And, and, and in your book, you kind of, uh, and in the movie, you allude to the fact that we're in a majority rules kind of mentality. It's kind of, you know, two wolves and a sheep deciding what's for, what's for lunch. 
and, and, and we're, we're the sheep in this situation, the people who are earning income, who are learning, who are, are listening to you right now. So I think getting out of the way of the tax train is a big thing for us. But I, I, I see, and maybe I'm kind of curious as to your, um, your thought on this. What is, what's that big mistake people are, are understanding? Is it that they just are continuing to do what everybody else is doing by putting money in these tax deferred plans? Or what do you see as one of those big uh, stumbling blocks for people? Well, Ed Slot in the, um, as you know, Ed Slot has done uh, six different specials for PBS and his, in the forward that he did for me in the power of zero, he states, and he did an excellent job in the forward, by the way. I mean, you could, you could just read his forward and then put the book down and be done. Right. Um, <laughs> but in his book, he, he says, he says, people think, Hey, there's no way this can happen to me. Okay. There is no way that the government would raise taxes on me because they haven't seen high taxes in their lifetime. But he says, if you look at the history of tax rates in our country, you can see it's nothing short, uh, nothing short of a roller coaster ride. We've seen tax rates that were uh, 94% post World War II. They were 90% as recently as 1960. Throughout the 70s, they were as high as 70%. Um, so, in essence, the government has used taxes, income taxes, as a slush fund for uh, all of their different. Uh, petty projects and, and wars and, and expenditures. And I don't think that's going to be any different this time around. So I think one of the big problems is people say they would never do that. They would never raise taxes. Well, guess what? When given the choice between going bankrupt as a country or raising taxes, I mean, look at, look at what's happening in France right now. There's rioting in the streets because they are actually doing precisely what people thought they never would. So I, I'm going to tell you this. We've got $21 trillion of debt. There's roughly $21 trillion in the cumulative 401ks and IRAs across our country. There's only about $800 billion in the cumulative Roth IRAs and Roth 401ks and Roth conversions across the country. The money to be had is in these, these tax-deferred accounts. And so, uh, as, as Ed Slot rightly says, they are coming after your accounts you have entered into a business partnership with the IRS in the moment you made that first contribution to that first account. And um, every year they get to vote on what percentage of your profits they get to keep. Not a very good business partnership, if you ask me. Don Blanton has that amazing analogy where he says, look, you know, if I'm the federal government and I want to give you a loan and you say, great, I could use the money. By the way, I'm not going to tell you the interest rate and I'm not going to require that you pay it back. I'm going to wait until I actually need the money to ask for it back. And then at that moment in time, I'll let you know what the interest rate is. He says, would you cash, cash that check? He says, not in a million years. And then he goes, that's what the federal government's doing with your Roth IRAs, sorry, with your IRAs and 401ks. And right now they're $21 trillion of debt. So it's just not a, a, a smart proposition to use these accounts beyond what I prescribe in, in my book, The Power of Zero. Wow, I'm, I'm almost overwhelmed just con continuing to hear this again. But we've got to actually bring some action to this, right? Because for those of our clients that have seen this, they've heard this, some of them are sitting on big IRA balances, a traditional IRAs for that matter. And you, you make the uh, point in the book that in some cases, you don't have just extra cash laying around to do this Roth conversion. What are some of the things that you're recommending people um, consider in light of this impending you know, tax train coming and having that deferred account? Well, first of all, if you are younger than 59 and a half, um, it's tough to do Roth conversions because you can't pay the tax on the Roth conversion out of the Roth conversion itself. You can't just have the government withhold the tax because they'll give you a 10% penalty. It's actually a penalty for early withdrawal. So that's something you gotta think about it. There's other ways to get money out of there, 72 Ts. I go into that in my book. You got to figure out if that's a good strategy for you or not. But really, um, you know, when it comes to Roth conversions, you don't want to convert all of it in one year. You want to spread that tax liability out over a number of years. I typically try to tell people that, hey, if you're going to do a Roth conversion, get all the heavy lifting done before 2026 because you know that tax rates are going up for good in 2026. Tax rates will never be as low as they are at this point in time. Uh, 2028, 2030 and beyond, tax rates will be certainly substantially higher than they will be in 2026. So it's just, it's just downhill from here. You know, you've got to, you will look back on the year 2018 and say, 
man, why did I not take advantage of tax rates while they were historically low? Could you imagine um, in, in, in 1944 and 1945 looking into your crystal ball and saying, someday you will have a federal marginal tax bracket of only 22% if you make you know, above 77.4 up to $165,000. That, that would have been unheard of back then. And I think that 10 to 15 years from now, it'll be unheard of. People will look back and say, what was I doing? What, why was I not consistently and systematically repositioning my, my tax deferred assets to tax free? Because we'll never see these low tax rates again in our lifetime. So I, I, uh, I'm curious, but I know that you mentioned um, before we came on the, the show that you had recently moved to Puerto Rico. We've talked a little bit about that on our show, that there's a lot of people uh, seeking Puerto Rico and their uh, financial uh, benefit from, you know, the low tax rates there, 4% to be, uh, you know, transparent, which is, I'm very uh, much coveting that 4% right now, David. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm wondering how many, uh, how many of your neighbors who are sitting in the gated community that are holding qualified plan balances wouldn't uh, consider uh, taking it out and paying 4% on it uh, all in one year um, and wondering if that would be a good deal for them down the road. Yeah, you know, I, I talked to my CPA about it. He gave me a little bit of a vague response. So I feel, I still feel like I need to research it further. But but basically what I asked him is I said, hey, let's assume I had a lot of money in a, you know, a tax deferred account like an IRA or 401k. If I did a Roth conversion, would I pay 4% tax on that? And his opinion seemed to be that because it was a U.S. based account, not a Puerto Rico based account that the U S rules would prevail. Therefore the U S tax brackets would prevail. Gotcha. I'm not 100% sold that that sold on that answer. So I feel like I need to research it more, but that was his initial impression. But certainly if you could take advantage of a, an effective, non-progressive effective 4% tax rate, then you would be behooved to simply convert all of your tax deferred accounts all in one year. Yeah. And go ahead and take the penalty. It would still be a, a discount. It would still be a great idea. Yeah. yeah. All right. So um, we're, we, we read through your book and uh, you, you kind of lay out a plan. It says uh, the tax train's coming, one. Two, that uh, it's going to come in the form of higher taxes. And three, we know exactly when it's going to get here, which is 2026. Help us walk through uh, kind of your recommendation on – what you tell people to do, what's their, what should be their strategy uh, between now and 2026 and, and their taxable, tax-deferred, and tax-free accounts. Help, help our, uh, our listener understand what you believe is the, the, the best plan uh, that you've laid out in your book, The Power of Zero. So a lot of this, a lot of my advice is going to vary depending on your age and where you are in life. But generally speaking, this is the tax, this is the tax, you know, power of zero paradigm. In a rising tax rate environment, there is a mathematically perfect amount of money to have in your taxable and tax deferred buckets. Taxable bucket, we want to have about six months worth of basic living expenses. Tax deferred bucket, you want to have your RMDs in retirement be small enough that they can be offset by your standard deduction. Uh, but also be small enough that they don't cause Social Security taxation. And Social Security taxation can cause you to run out of money five to seven years faster than people who do not have their Social Security taxed. So we have basic minimum, sorry, maximum thresholds that you want to have in these first two buckets. Anything above and beyond those, those minimal thresholds should be systematically repositioned to tax-free. When I say systematically, not all in one year, stretch that tax liability out over as many years as you can, but get all the heavy lifting done before tax rates go up. So we've got about eight years to pull that off. January 1st, it's only seven years. So, so really it's number one, identifying the ideal balances in those first two buckets. Number two, systematically repositioning uh, any excess balances to uh, tax free. And then finally, if it makes sense, peel off a portion of those shifts and, and, and put it, you know, put a portion of that shift into what we call the life insurance retirement plan because a life insurance retirement plan can accomplish some things that uh, none of those other tools can accomplish. I'm a big fan, if you've read my book, of not having all your eggs in one basket. The LIRP makes a lot of sense. It's a very attractive tool, but when used in, 
in, in complement and in concert with Roth IRAs, Roth 401ks, these types of things. I'm not sure where your part paradigm is on that, but the LIRP can be very powerful, but used in concentrated doses. So that's, I think, what I would say to people who um, are looking to, you know, looking to be in the best possible position for retirement at this point. Well, I, I think, you know, uh, I, our, our brand is Wealth Without Wall Street. So we're, we're not huge fans of the investments that most 401ks, either Roth or traditional or Roth IRAs or traditional are invested in. Now, we, uh, we do have lots of clients that are, uh, that are actually using their, their Roth IRAs and um, uh, other uh, investment accounts to invest in non-typical uh, market-based things. They're, they're looking, they're actually doing lending, they're doing real estate, they're, they're finding ways that they actually can control and they understand something about it. And so we're fans of those for sure. Um, I, I do think there's still a contract with the government and I do think we need to be wary. I, I like the fact that you pointed out there's $21 trillion in 401ks and there's only $800 billion in Roth IRA. So I do think that that's not going to be the first place the government's going to go. But it only, you only have to look back to 2010 when uh, President Obama in his State of the Union address actually threw out the trial balloon of taxing 529 plan distributions, which, sure. you know, there, there's now people who are actually trying to, you know, backdoor into Roth IRAs in essence through 529 plans. They're, they're using those as a, uh, you know, a loophole in order to try to get some of the same benefits. I do think at some point uh, we're going to see some of those loopholes uh, changed or shut down. And I don't know in what form, but I do think what you said is, is accurate. It's if you have an IRA balance, I do think you need to uh, heed your advice that there is a tax train coming. We need to look at how can we transition that. And for our, our client base, they, yeah, it, whether it's all at once, it, it's a, a dramatic uh, uh, approach that like Joey took, or maybe there's some that can take more sophisticated measures using uh, conservation easements or other things in order to partner with these things to reduce their tax bracket. But one of the things you said I want to come back to, and I, it's the reason I brought it up earlier and I don't want to presume, so I want to uh, ask this question, is you mentioned in your book about uh, Social Security, uh, taxes on Social Security. And, and for if you're a married person, you make more than 32000 and have more than 32000 provisional income, then some of your Social Security would be taxed. And if you have more than 44000 in provisional income, it'll be taxed at 85% uh, of it will be subject to taxation. Have you done the math to figure out, uh, you know, what, what that looks like for a person? I know you talked about how long it will last, but what does it look like uh, in relationship to their taxes? So in a such a, I'm going to go back and ask the question a little clearer. When I asked earlier, should someone who's in this highest tax bracket be still deferring, uh, how much of them building a big enough balance to what's going to make all of their social security tax in the future? How, do, how much does that play in your decision? Well, so, so this is what we got to be clear on. Um, once you hit that $44,000 threshold and up to, and, and you, you get in trouble if you don't use just the right language with people up to 85% of your social security can be taxable at your highest marginal tax bracket. So it's sort of a sliding scale, and, and it's not until you hit about $80,000 of provisional income that you hit that 85% level where 85% of your Social Security becomes taxable. So what some people will say is, does it make sense to do all of this Roth converting and pay all the taxes along the way just so you can get your Social Security tax-free, right? Just so that you can pare down your provisional income, and remember, any distributions from your IRAs are provisional income and will and can cause your Social Security to be taxed. Does it make sense to pay all that tax just so that you can get your Social Security tax free? And again, there's no cookie cutter approach. There's no one size fits all. I'd have to run the math and, and see if it makes sense. And that's why we're very big on these before and after comparisons because we have computer software that takes all of those things into account and will literally tell us if the recommendation that we've given will ultimately push someone further down the road than where they'd otherwise be. We've talked about this before on the show. We have our own pontification going on about Social Security, but I'd love to hear your, uh, your thoughts concerning um, a lot of our client bases between, you know, 30 to 
30 to 50 years old and they're looking down the road and saying, is it really even going to be here? Like, should we even be concerned about it? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? You know, when you look at these presidential debates over the last two cycles, what the politicians always talk about is, hey, if you're, if you're over age 50, you don't have to worry about anyone touching your social security. If you're younger than 50, it may be modified. It may not exist in its current arrangement for you. Really, this is hitting a moving target. What I, if, if I were to look into my crystal ball, I see, uh, uh, I see taxes going up, and I also see them moving the, um, the, the minimum retirement age back to maybe 70 or 72 to try to help keep the thing solvent. But you know what? I tell people that are my age and your age, do not plan on Social Security being around plan on running it alone, going it alone. If social security happens to be around when you retire, consider it icing on the cake, but you're responsible for your cake. <laughs> well, Joey loves cake and he will, I um, do. he will I definitely do. be safeguarding his cake. Well, David, we appreciate you coming. I think it is it's imperative that we take control of our finances and as many assumptions and as many variables as we can remove that are out of our control, whether that be Wall Street, we, we talk a lot about that, or uh, the government's ability to raise taxes in the future, um, or uh, dependent upon uh, some uh, Social Security benefit if we're not already receiving it, I, I think that puts us in a more kind of confident future. So I appreciate you sharing what you do with your book and sharing it on the documentary and coming on our podcast. Uh, we, we always appreciate that. How, how can our audience hear more about you and, and get access to things that you're doing? I know that you mentioned that you even have a new book that's going to come out pretty soon. Got a new book coming out. If they want, if they have not read The Power of Zero uh, yet, that's certainly available on Amazon. If they want to buy it in bulk discounts, they can go to thepowerofzerobook.com. They won't get it cheaper uh, anywhere else but right there. Uh, the, you know, the, the documentary certainly is something that they're going to want to watch because that informs a lot of the debate. Um, I do have a new book coming out in the next two months or so, so keep an eye out on that. And then certainly davidmcknight.com is always a great resource. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.